بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا اللهم لا سهلا إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا Dear brothers and sisters and friends السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First of all I'd like to thank greatly the brothers and sisters at Hugs for supporting my family while I was held in Belmarsh under the anti-terror legislation. Hugs and the work that they've been doing over the past years has been crucial to helping those people who've fallen foul of anti-terror legislation and measures in this country. And it is one of those few success stories we can see that the Muslim community in this country should be proud of, even though that this time in history for us is probably the most difficult we've ever faced. And like Adnan asked earlier, is it going to get worse? For a surety, it will. For a surety. And the reason why that's going to happen is because standing up in front of injustice, you will have to pay a price. That's the sunnah of life, it's the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the sunnah of his prophets, and the sunnah of those who followed on good. So people will have to be sacrificed, and people will have to sacrifice. Before I was arrested, uh, by about two to three months, I was in South Africa, and I visited a, a prison. It's the first actual proper prison I've been in. I've been in military prisons and detention camps and secret detention sites, but they don't count. It was the first real prison that I'd been in. And I was invited to go and speak to the prisoners inside Paulsmore Prison, which is near Cape Town, and the last prison Mandela was held in before he was released uh, to house arrest. And I spoke to a series of prisoners there, including many Muslim prisoners and gave them the story of Bagram and Guantanamo and ultimately hope that in, as Malcolm X said, prison, if a man wishes to, he can change his life or it can change his life. And I couldn't help but to think that in this country that's been affected so much by its leaders and by its people who are fighting for the rights of the oppressed, that prison, torture, abuse, rape, all as state, the state's apparatus to use against those of its population it wants to subdue has been used so much as an example for the world. In fact, if you look at the most up until he died, recognized person on the face of the planet, you could arguably have said it was a convicted terrorist, Nelson Mandela. In fact, the British government in its hypocrisy the same government, the Tory government, who at the time used to call for Nelson Mandela to be hanged, has erected statues of him outside Parliament. And it's these type of hypocrisies they think that we can't see through, but we can. Because for as much as they want to tell us, the Muslim community, that you are under the microscope, you are being watched, you are being targeted, we're listening to everything that you say. We have to remind them, say to them, that we are the nation of the people from birth till death who believe we are watched. And not only are you watching us, not only are we watching you right back, but the one who created us is watching us all together and is noting down people's deeds and actions, and there will be a recompense. But in the interim, dear brothers and sisters, whilst it is beautiful and amazing and uplifting to see this hall filled with brothers and sisters who care about the issues and the matters that HUGS supports, we are not the majority. We are a minority within a minority. Because essentially, it is a small number of people 
who directly get attended, uh, uh, affected by the effects of anti-terror legislation. It's a growing problem. Islamophobia is a growing problem. People are being targeted again and again. But until you actually feel it, until it's your door that's barged down and broken down, until it's your family that are made to sit in a room in the corner surrounded by officers, until it's you whose hands are cuffed in your own house where you live, until it's you that's been frightened or attempted to be frightened by the most powerful law enforcement agencies in the world, followed by the most powerful legal systems in the world. It's really hard for you to empathize. You can think, you can attempt to be part of that, you can attempt to put yourself in that position, but we become so desensitized by the constant barrage we hear daily about arrest after arrest after arrest, let alone what's happening in the various parts of the Muslim world that we are affected by. But then again, it was never the larger number of people who made the change. It was only al qalilun min qalilin min qalil. It was only the few from amongst the few from amongst the few who Allah chose to be tested and who Allah chose, as the brother was describing, to be helped by those who stood on the right-hand side like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu stood with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But history bears witness to those who stood with the oppressed. One of the lessons I've often said to our brothers and sisters here is that do not look at yourself as a community that's only unique simply because you're Muslims. There are things that are passed by before. The Quran mentions, وَالَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ it, takes, it tells you to look at the examples of those that went before you to take a lesson. And you can see in this country what happened to the black community and to the Irish community and to the trade unions and other groups of people. I urge my brothers and sisters that if you don't know about what happened at the height of the troubles with, uh, with Northern Ireland, take some trips to Belfast and to Derry and try to understand how it is that a community is targeted, vilified, called terrorists, imprisoned, and laws have been churned out in order to apply on them. And then see what happens when a community stands for itself that stands up for those who are being demonized and vilified. You'll see something there. There have been all sorts of problems. But you'll learn something from the stories of those that went before you. And it is not right that we live here in this country and not are aware of its history and what passed before. For as the brother said earlier on, we're passing through this test. But as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ After the difficulty, ease will come. And if you had any doubt about that, then Allah says it again. إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَ That the ease will come after the difficulty. But if we don't stand with people who are facing injustice, and if we never stood with them in the past, how can we ask them to stand with us today? So we must be the people who stand up even if it's at risk to ourselves. We must be the people who stand up for those who are facing oppression, if it's from Muslims or if it's from non-Muslims. That has to be the defining factor from amongst us. The justice that we claim on our tongues of Islam has to follow of the, with the justice that Islam offers to all people. And we can't keep complaining that we are being barraged by anti-terror legislations and injustice, yet we remain silent. Man ra'a minkum munkaran bi yadi. From whomever amongst you sees an evil, let him change it with his hand. For in lam yastatifa bi lisani. And if he's unable to do, do so, then at least with his tongue. For in lam yastatifa bi qalbi. And if he's unable to do that, then at least in his heart despise it. And that is the lowest rank of faith. Being silent, being apathetic, being lethargic is no longer an option. The laws that are being passed in this country, the likes of which we have never seen before, we have to all become articulate. We have to all imagine that members of our family 
are being detained or targeted. And we have to all become defenders, every single one. You compromised it while you pretended that it was your dean that stopped you from acting. That can no longer be an excuse, my dear brothers. Belmarsh is filled with Muslims whose only crime was to want to defend the oppressed. When they were arrested, just like me, like the majority of anti-terror arrests in this country, the police quickly note, very quickly, there was no threat to the security of Britain. Yet the government keeps saying there is a threat. Who's telling the truth? The government? The police? Are they both lying? Are they both telling the truth? Who's deciphering it? Who's challenging it? How can it be that we as Muslim prisoners are placed as category A prisoners, which are deemed to be the most dangerous in the country? alongside gangland murderers, alongside people who have killed police officers, alongside child killers. Those who wanted to go over to Syria just to help, nothing else, are placed alongside those people and are given sentences, as you have heard, the likes of which you cannot imagine. Why isn't there an uproar in the community? Because what's happening is the waters are being tested. They're asking to see who will respond. And if you all remain silent and do nothing, then the sin is upon you. Every person who's able to write must be able to use that pen. Every, every person who's able to speak must be able to use his tongue. And there's a duty upon him or her to ensure that if you see a justice, you don't just talk about it. That you follow through with action. There are systems in this country available to you. Yes, everything is against us. Everything's against us. But then there wouldn't be any tests if it wasn't. So don't be afraid of that. Allah brought you your test to you. So dear brothers and sisters, please understand that assisting hugs is the least you can do. The very least. And assisting with your wealth is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us again and again. Bi amwalikum wa anfusikum. He mentions your wealth before he mentions yourselves. So, deep, so impart your wealth. But let that be the first thing that you do. Making sure that you stand up through organizations like CAGE and others to assist the work that we are doing to help change our position in this country. Because we are being constantly targeted and it will not stop. And you have seen now that the truth has come out with the CIA torture report. It's the tip of the iceberg. That only highlighted to us the numbers of prisoners held by the CIA or questioned by the CIA. The majority of the people were not held by the CIA. The majority were held by the US military. A report about that still has yet to come. We're here because of torture. What's happening in Iraq and Syria is a direct response to those organizations that were born in the dungeons of Abu Ghraib and Camp Bukha and all of the other places. It's a whirlwind that's being reaped. And we are the voices, we are the target community. There are people from amongst us who are able to empower and are able 
bring that voice forward, but if you don't assist us, then this difficult struggle ahead of us is going to be very weighty and we may just get overwhelmed by it. So we need your help, dear brothers and sisters. We need your help desperately. And final thing I would say is just a little anecdote. The other day I was sitting in the car with my son. He's only young. He was born after I was taken into custody in Guantanamo. And I saw him first when he was around three years old. He's still a small boy. And as we were driving along, he sat in the front seat. Usually, he's your older brothers and sisters sit in the front, but he decided to take the front seat. And he put down the sun visor, but he's too short for that to have any effect. So the rays of the sun started hitting him in the eye, and he started to trouble his eyes. And I said, son, sometimes being a front seat passenger is going to be the hardest part of the journey. It's a lesson for life, son. It's a lesson for life. Jazakumullah khair, subhanakallah wa bihamdika, ashadun la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu.